Are you ready to perform at your highest potential? Thank you for joining this GP Strategies webinar, where we'll explore best practices and innovative insights to help you and your organization improve performance. Hello, everyone. Thank you uh, for joining us today. Um, I just want to give it just a minute to let everybody kind of join in and log in. Um, so while that's happening, before I turn it over to our presenters, why don't I just go over a little housekeeping. So to begin with, first of all, hello and welcome to today's webinar discussion, Design Digital Adoption Journeys for Large Enterprises. My name is Kim Heyer. I'm with GP Strategies, and I'm happy to be your host for today's session. So before we get started, I just want to cover a couple of items. Um, first, we are recording this and a link to the recording and a copy of the presentation will be sent to you in a follow up email within 24 hours of this webinar. I do say that if you have any questions, if you can use the Q&A option um, and that way we can um, answer them during the presentation and or at the end of today's webinar time given. And again, I just want to thank you all for joining today's session, and I'm really excited to introduce you to today's presenters. So our presenters today are Nikita Patney. She's our business development manager for enterprise technology adoption in EMEA with GP Strategies. Uh, we have Gracie Flores, who's the director of value realization and COE program with WhatFix. And Paul Tofus, he's the head of North America and EMEA Services Partners from WhatFix. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to today's presenters. The floor is yours. Thank you, Kim, and welcome everyone to our webinar this afternoon. It's great to have you all with us. As, for, as Kim mentioned, I'm Nikita Patney. I'm with GP Strategies, and I work within the Enterprise Technology Adoption Division. So that allows me to work with customers from different industries using very many different software platforms, um, from the big names to some of the in-house bespoke solutions as well. I've worked within learning performance readiness for over six years um, and have the pleasure of helping businesses and customers understand and achieve their learning adoption needs. So with that, I'll, I'll hand you over to Gracie for a short introduction. Thank you. My name is Gracie Flores. I am the Director of Value Realization and our COE program at WAFIX. I work across um, both internal and external to the team. So across the uh, WhatFix organization to help our customers realize value. And we work with all of our different customers to help them set up the digital adoption programs and our COE program. And here's Paul. Thanks, Gracie. So hi, hello everyone. So Paul Toffis, um, I'm based in the UK, um, but I look after um, all our services partners in North America and Amir, Watfix has two types of partners. We have technology partnerships. So those are other software companies that used, use Watfix to support their customers. And we will ha also have services partners such as GP Strategy that um, recommend Watfix and use Watfix as part of their go-to-market strategy. I've been with Watfix for three and a half to four years. And um, yeah, I hope you, you enjoy this webinar. Nikita. Brilliant, thank you everyone. So thanks for joining us today as we look at designing digital adoption journeys for large enterprises. The topics that we're going to be looking to discuss this afternoon um, are what is a digital adoption platform and a bit of a 101 on what DAPs look like now. Um, how we'd start to structure a DAP for a large enterprise. And then, of course, the big topic of how to start designing a DAP center of excellence for large enterprises. And following that, we'll give you a short example of how that's been put into practice at one of Watfix's customers. Paul, I'll, I'll hand over to you to give you a bit of an explanation over who Watfix are and how they partner with GP Strategy. Thanks. Thank you, Nikita. By the way, everyone, if you do have any questions, paste them in the chat. And when we do our close, we'll do a, a short q and if there are any questions. So I, I won't spend long on here. Um, so let me just tell you who we are as Watfix. So Watfix was founded uh, just over nine years ago. Uh, we have two founders. One is our CEO, and he runs the business out of our uh, Bangalore, India-based 
headquarters and the other founder is our CTO and he runs his part of the business uh, out of our office in Han San Jose, uh, California. Um, we're a global company and uh, we have customers across the globe and we serve them through our offices in the US, in Europe and in Asia Pacific. Um, we've got a very high customer satisfaction score, especially for a SaaS uh, business. And one of the reasons uh, for that is that 50% of the new features of the, of the innovations that Watflix puts in its platform is based on, on customer uh, feedback. Every customer gets a customer success manager. So we get a lot of feedback uh, from our customers. And uh, we filed a number of patents on the Watflix platform to support some of the unique features uh, within the platform. Uh, and we have strong uh, partner relationships with partners such as GP Strategies. I've worked with Nikita since I joined uh, Watfix, but we've had a, uh, a partnership with uh, GP Strategies for, I think, now five years. Nikita? Brilliant. Thanks, Paul. So let's start to look at exactly what is a digital adoption platform um, and how has it evolved over time? So what you know what a digital adoption platform is a, a layer of software which is integrated on top of other applications or websites or um you know both training and guiding users through tasks and functionality so it relies very much on contextual information to give users support um, through features like tours tool, tool tips and overlaid instructions um, and very much a signposted journey as users navigate an application this essentially results in a much more consistent user experience across all systems used within an organization. And that support can be provided on applications that are used daily, but may have infrequent processes that users must complete. So for example, HR applications that we all use regularly to input, for example, our time cards or request holiday leave, but likely we'll only use once a year to complete our performance reviews. When it becomes time to submit this information, we may well be searching for the guide that shows us what we learned during training, maybe a year prior, or trying to guess our way through the process, um, as is my case. Um, and so using a digital adoption platform, you give users that support and that pre precise information that they need, specifically at the step of the process when they need it most. And DAPs and how they've evolved over the years um, they've been around for a long time uh, in some capacity or another. Some of you may recall you know, Clippy from the Microsoft Help Assistant, which um, came up in Windows 97 up. It would pop up and say something like, hey, it looks like you're typing a letter. Would you like some help? At, at the time, we didn't really like it. But now this type of point of need learning really helps us carry out our daily jobs and reduce that need for upfront training. Um, and as the APs have evolved from content and information stored outside of an application and access as needed to an embedded help and robotic automa automation. And that's only going to increase as AI becomes more of a prolific part of our daily working life. The progress of DAPs has followed you know, the changing workforce. We now live in a world of instant gratification, notifications and access to content. And the modern learner wants content pushed to them as they would in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and so learning has to be on demand and just like things are outside of work. Paul, I'll, I'll hand over to you on what that digital experience layer looks like. Thanks, Nikita. So I just want to take a couple of minutes to explain the architecture of a digital adoption platform like Watfix. Um, you have uh, effectively two, two segments. You have the platform itself, which serves content to the user. And that content is delivered in the form of guided walkthroughs, pop-ups, beacons, self-help but it's delivered within the application at the point of need and the user can that, use that content whenever they want. Um, and the content itself takes two forms. Uh, we, we call it static content and dynamic content. Uh, the static content is sitting in your existing knowledge bases and your LMSs. And these can be videos, user guides, any form of document or image, which Watfix will find it will then contextualize it and deliver it to the user when needed. The other type of content, 
the dynamic content um, is created and managed by the platform administrators and editors. And these are the walkthroughs and the pop-ups and the beacons. And this dynamic content can even be used outside the Watfix platform because it can be saved as PDFs and videos uh, and slides or live links. And we call this adoption everywhere. And Watfix itself does not hook into the underlying application, but it's an overlay and we call this the digital experience layer. Nikita, next slide. Thank you. Uh, and the next one, thank you. So, so um, enterprises have continued to invest and will continue to invest in software applications. And, all, and a lot of this investment takes the form of large transformation projects. Uh, these are both application modernization projects and new applications. Uh, and you can see on this slide that many of these applications are cloud-based applications and some large enterprises uh, can have over 900 different applications. At Watfix, we're not a large enterprise yet, uh, but even we use over 200 applications. And I personally use at least 10 different applications daily, both on uh, uh, both mobile and on my desktop uh, via a browser. Next slide, thank you. Um, McKinsey estimates that of the billions of dollars spent on these transformation projects, that less than 30% of those projects are successful and meet the expectations had when the money was invested. And Deloitte confirms this in a study this year that they found 70% of business transformation projects failing. And both these studies underline that one of the largest reasons for these failures uh, is the lack of adoption by those who use to, who need to use the applications, causing Deloitte to ask, are people still our greatest asset? Next slide. And there are many challenges to adoption. Uh, and here on, on this slide are the, the ones that we believe are the key ones. And you can summarize uh, the points as follows. Lack of visibility into the usage of the application, lack of usage of the application and, and why there is a lack of usage, a lack of real-time support of the users at the process level within the application, and the lack of tailored support and guidance uh, to the users. Next slide. Now this looks like a busy slide, but I wanted to share with you how the evolution of digital adoption has really turned adoption on its head because digital adoption in its first use was simply a training tool providing guidance inside the application. And then automation and support capabilities were added to increase user productivity and also to drive compliance. And now we have analytics capabilities looking at user actions within an application and nudging them when we see a need uh, working somewhat like a personal assistant to the user. However, customers are now starting their digital adoption journeys with analytics first, looking to identify the points of need based on user behavior. The content authoring is then prioritized based on the need, which gives an immediate benefit and an ROI before the customer then moves on to roll out digital adoption across multiple applications. And another change is that the content search capabilities that were built into early versions of our digital adoption tool have now evolved to deliver enterprise search capabilities, allowing a user to search enterprise knowledge bases from within an application. And what does the future hold? Well, in the near future, you will see AI being used to increase user productivity through the use of automating and completing user actions. And then AI will also be used to automate the creation of content and the management of that content, increasing the productivity of those content developers. 
And, and in summary, but just before I hand you back to Nikita, uh, Watfix has been at the forefront of driving innovation on digital adoption platforms. And we believe that digital adoption should always be data driven. Data should be used to provide help and support at the point of need. Digital adoption tools should provide support for multiple platforms such as web, desktop and mobile. And users should be able to work on processes seamlessly across all applications on all platforms. And technical expertise should not be a prerequisite to those doing content development and content support. Back to you, Nikita. Thanks, Paul. And following on from what Paul just mentioned there about a digital adoption platform being driven by data and, and being able to be accessed across multiple applications, there are three real key steps to look at when you start embarking on this journey. And one is identifying all of the applications that you have within your enterprise. Um, you know, looking across and mapping out where your interactions are between different roles with applications. A study by Watfix recently identified that 93% of employees could not do their job without the help of at least three software applications, with 50% citing the need for six applications a day. Um, as Paul mentioned, Watfix themselves use over 200 applications, and similar to Paul, I use over 10 applications daily to do my job. Um, once you start to identify these applications, you can then put together a more comprehensive picture of the, the architectural landscape of your, your software um, and which applications are the most business critical. From there, it's really important to start identifying individual user journeys through this application. Um, mapping out the roles that play the, the most important part of your business um, and how they are interacting with different systems on a daily basis. How many of those tasks that they're doing to complete their role bridge multiple applications? Um, and one of the key goals for any program is to create an engaging user experience. And by mapping these processes and journeys, organizations, we can simplify these processes and identify where our employees need the most help and where they may be experiencing the most difficulties. And once we have all of that information, similar to what Paul said in, in his, his remarks earlier, it's really important to start monitoring the adoption of multiple applications across your business and how that's being used. And um, now that you have that path and you've got the different roles mapped out, you can use the technology available to review, you know, where people are engaging with systems, um, how that might be differing from application to application. 84% of employees say that the software that they use on a daily basis, they don't know how to use some of the core functionality. And that's because there's simply not enough time for them to sit through training modules and guides whilst they're trying to carry out their daily tasks. But by monitoring these adoption levels at a detailed process level, learning teams, IT teams, they can start to push relevant content to users, which they can access and review at the point of need. And it also takes that burden off of those learning teams who are getting pulled from pillar to post, trying to create engaging content for users across the business. So with that, I'll hand you over to Gracie to talk about designing a DAP for a center of excellence for large enterprises. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, my name is Gracie Flores and um, a little bit about myself, just to let you know, you know where I come from and why I think the way I do. So I was the senior product manager of digital adoption at Nestle for 27 years. I left there at the end of last year. I started working with Wafix in January. So I spent, you know, four years um, the, the delivering a, a technical learning and training program. And then uh, the last six years or so working on, in the digital adoption space. So what we did um, during those 10 years at Nestle was we basically established the Nestle Digital Adoption Center. And I know I have some of my colleagues on the call. So hi, guys. Um, so we got, you know, I come from a, a background where I'm, you know, experienced in, in implementing these programs and the COEs. And I understand the challenges that come with it, but also the benefits that come with it. And that's why I, this is what I'm doing at WebFix is, is building these programs for our customers. OK, next slide. So one of the things that I wanted to do was sort of give you a, a picture, right, of what a digital adoption implementation looks like um, to a customer. So there are really two sides to it. On the, on the right hand side, you have all the things that are platform based. And these are all the technical things that need to happen to be able to execute 
your digital adoption platform. But what's just as important is the things that are on the left. You need to have you know, good customer success services, uh, implementation, product training, content creation. Then you need to have you know, adapt community and community management. Um, and the thing that is often missing um, is the value realization services. You really need to have a dedicated team or people that understand the customer value management process and also you know, how to support a center of excellence, implement the center of excellence. So that little white box right there, that's actually what I do at, Nes at, um, at Webfix and, and my, what my team does. Okay, next slide. So what is the digital adoption center of excellence? I wanted to put this here because most people have, I, I know you understand the concept of COE, but there are some guiding principles that go along with um, a center of excellence, right? And um, those are, you know, that it needs to be a dedicated team. It's very difficult to really achieve success if you have people working 20, 30, 50% of the time. So it's a dedicated team within the, your organization that focuses on maximizing the value and the effectiveness of your DAP implementations. It also acts as a centralized hub for expertise, best practices, resources, all of that related to optimizing your DAP and the value to get out of it. And then the last thing is, you know, the COE is there to accelerate the value creation of the digital adoption platform and to showcase that value back to the key stakeholders. So even though it has many other things, to me, these are the three most important things um, that it can do. Okay. So how does that look like, right? So it's kind of hard to create a picture of a COE, but I did the best I could here. So one of the things to understand is that you don't have one set of stakeholders when you're managing a center of excellence, you have many. And the longer you stay in business, the more stakeholders will, you will have. Because you may start with business unit, process owners, IT product managers, but now I'm seeing a lot more of digital experience managers, digital transformation managers coming to the DAP COE and saying, how can you help us? right? Product portfolio managers who are really trying to understand, are people really using these applications? Do we need to keep them? Can we save, you know, money? Can we lower cost of licensing? What can you show me? What can you help me identify um, to help me understand that? So when I was at Nestle, we had, you know, almost half of our applications that were using our digital adoption platform where they're collecting data just so that we can provide that data back to our, uh, process team and our product portfolio teams. It wasn't even to build content on yet. So there's a lot of different uses for the data that we collect. And the other thing to understand, oh, not yet, one more. Go back up a little bit, yeah. The other thing to understand is that um, a COE may sit in different parts of an organization, but these are the key roles that you really need to make it happen. So you need someone who's gonna lead the DAP strategy and evangelize the, the, the solutions but it's very important to have a technical lead, um, a business analyst, project manager, and then the content development, building the DAP solutions, that is something that you can share across the organization. So building those DAP capabilities so that you, you can really scale um, the DAP solutions is really important. So you need someone inside the team who's really good at understanding the tech. Um, so in my instance at Nestle, our tech lead was also our implementation lead or our learning and training lead. And so that really allowed us to create as many as, I think I when I left was around 286 people within the organization that had some sort of a DAP role where they could create content, um, use the analytics or something like that. Now, not all roles have to be internal. You do have and can partner, um, and so did we, so that you can bring some of these capabilities and capacity into your organization without necessarily having a large COE team internally. Okay, now we can switch over. Now, a lot of things that people say is, well, what is the focus really? What does, you know, what should the COE be focusing on? What I believe is that, you know, um, I like to use this, this particular model a lot because it kind of helps people understand what it is that a COE does or, and why it's in place. So I think we all understand that, you know, we get results, whether in our personal life or at work, we get results because of the actions that we take, right? people's actions get results. And people act the way that they act and do the things that they do because of what they believe. And our beliefs are then you know, reinforced by the experiences that we have. So 
think about it in the term uh, for digital adoption, right? So if you have very bad experiences with technology, your onboarding to that tech was bad, training was you know, not what you expected, you find it difficult to find things, you don't really know when new features are being you know, added, you're gonna have a certain attitude about that technology and you're either gonna use a very little or you're gonna do a workaround so not to use it at all. And so that type of behavior then is why it's going to block your organization from getting the results that you need. Not to mention that the individual also doesn't get any type of productivity gains that they should have gotten from using the application. So at the end of the day, if you really want to get the right results, organizational or even through personal results for a person, for an employee, we need to start looking at the experiences that they have with technology. And that's why, you know, I've always said that the value proposition of our COE was always to deliver um, personalized and user experiences so that people could get comfortable with technology and then really be able to leverage and to, to get really productive at it, right? So that's sort of where, you know, we focused um, our digital adoption center of excellence at Nestle and what we tried to coach our customers in doing, okay? So um, COEs, right? So one of the things that ooh, Watfix is really introducing is the whole concept around userization. So userization goes well beyond customization. And so what I mean by customization is that usually that's when you take a, a new application, bring it into your organization, and you're gonna adapt that technology for the specific needs of your organization, right? Um, you don't alter the, for, the core functionalities, but you also aren't personalizing that for the user. Normally when you're customizing something, it's not the user that you have in mind, it is taking that one application and making it fit into your organization. On the other way, far end of the spectrum is personalization, right? So personalization goes way deeper into tailoring technology and changing it and creating a very highly customized user experience. Now, if anyone's ever tried this, you know how difficult that is. And it's very expensive. And not only that, as soon as something changes, um, you have a problem. So even though this could have been done maybe 10 years ago, today it's almost impossible because almost every application works in some sort of an agile way where they are delivering new features and new things every month, every quarter. So being able to personalize and keep up with that rate of change is almost impossible. So what's in the middle, right? So what's in the middle is userization. And that refers to the process of designing digital solutions or digital adoption solutions that meet that specific need of the individual, but can be done very quickly, uh, fast, uh, low cost, you know, and it can be tailored to the application, but you're not tailoring to a person, you're tailoring more to like the user experience for anyone who comes into that particular application. So it's a lot more manageable and a lot easier to keep up with. And then you can even build it into the development cycle of your application so that when you have new releases, they just go and tweak the, the, the app content or create it as needed, okay? So it's sort of like the sweet spot in the middle, okay? Um, benefits of a COE. Well, there are lots of benefits to having a COE, but I just wanna talk about one in particular, and that is delivering value at scale. Um, value realization is not an event, okay? I preach this all the time. It is really a process. And you cannot have value realization without having done all the other things that come with it right, before it, right? So it really starts with value discovery. And that is when you need to identify what your required results are. And again, and if you think about it, it's pretty much that pyramid all over again, right? What are you trying to achieve? And what are their behaviors, user behaviors that you need to be able to achieve that? Then based on those behaviors, you design those user experiences, you define KPIs to measure that, make sure that that's trending in the right direction. Before you ever publish anything, establish a baseline. Um, digital adoption platforms have product analytics and have certain features that you can put ahead of the deployment of content so you can establish those baselines. And those are really important. Then you deliver the content. You have a month, you have the analytics set up so you can have month to month trend tracking. And then at the end of the day, once a quarter um, or once every six months, you can then have these benefits and ROI or value reviews where you can see whether or not your solutions are trending and delivering what you expect, that return on investment. 
So one of the most important things that a COE does is set up this process inside your organization to make sure that you are realizing value. And that's not just from your DAP implementations, but also from the underlying technology. Are you achieving the business outcomes that you're expecting by influencing the right user behavior? Okay. So the other thing that um, I started doing at Wattfix was try to simplify a little bit or standardize the way that we um, create value. So I call these our value models. And so this is an example of the model that we're using. So we're gonna take a business objective and we're gonna break that into value drivers. And then what, is it, what does it take to achieve, right? This particular objective. Then that value driver is broken down into those user behaviors. And user behaviors are then turned into KPIs. So you can see here, completing onboarding task list um, by 50%, right? So that is the user action, is completing that task list. Um, it is um, adoption rate of a particular application or adoption of certain key figures. So we need to make them smart objectives, something that was measurable and time sensitive um, so that we can really track our success rates, right? So once we understand what we're going to influence and what, how we're going to measure it, we create what we call a solution set. And then that we can estimate how long it's gonna to take to build that or the cost to do that. If you're going to you know, provide that uh, to a partner to build for you. And then most importantly, we have both guidance and product analytics. And the difference being that guidance analytics are user interaction with your DAP content Obviously you want them to consume that content because that's what's going to change the user behavior. So you're gonna track that, but that in itself is not value. That is how value is created, right? The solution is deployed and user are using it. To determine whether the value is actually created, you need product analytics. You need to understand that user behavior in that system before and after your DAP implementation so that you can see the difference and see whether your solutions are actually having an impact. All of that, um, becomes what we call a value model. And then we're able to both, you know, discover, create and deliver and showcase value back to our customers. Okay, next slide. Um, and I'm not gonna read through these. I put this here so that you can have them later on, but a COE supports, like I said, many different stakeholders, um, but the most key stakeholders really are the three that I selected to show here, right? One is your app owners. They provide visibility to user behavior in the application, adoption and usage of the application key features, setting and tracking compliance to standard is really important, reinforcing the right digital behaviors, and then supporting um, the users with a 24 seven self-serve, right? Which is really important now with all our <clears throat> uh, remote workforce. Um, so that's, that's around application owners. Then when you look at the IT department, if you go to the next slide, yep. So the IT department, you know, your CUA could be part of your IT or it could just be supporting part of your IT. But again, it provides productivity metrics back to um, the IT product owners to be able to help them calculate ROI of the target application. You have digital transformation initiatives, right? We require new tools and digital adoptions of those new tools not all, and, and the execution of additional workflows. Um, you want to sort of personalize and, or userize that user experience as much as possible. And then you want to reduce that maintenance cost, again, by providing that 24-7 self-service. And last but not least, right, you have your end users, um, which for sure, right, you want to have a value proposition for your end users, right? So that is providing a new and more effective way to learn to use technology, um, being able to complete tasks easily and accurately, Automating business processes is huge, right? Remove all those unnecessary clicks. Why not make people's life a whole lot easier? Um, when something changes in your application, you don't have to look at an email. You can get a notification or an alert as a pop-up. And then you can have contextual help right in the application so you don't have to search for your help, um, your guidance, your job aids. It should all be just one click away. So again, there's a lot of things that are involved in not only a COE, but in an entire DAP program. And these are just the basics of establishing a center of excellence. Okay, Paul, back to you. Thank you, Gracie. I think we're almost there. 
this is a slide uh, on a specific customer of uh, Watfix. Um, Nikita, next slide. Sure. Before we get on to the customer success stories, there are a couple of questions in here, Gracie, that I think would be great for you to cover off. Um, some really good questions. So the first one is, um, is there a, a right time to set up a DAP center of excellence? And how would we know if we're mature enough to start thinking of a center of excellence? Oh, that's a good question. So um, there is every, any time is the right time to set up a COE. I can tell you that. So I think the earlier, the sooner, the better, right? So even if you have one application, one application, if you believe that you know you're going to expand back across more than one application, I think a, a center of excellence is a great thing to have. Um, the reason for that is because you, the sooner that you you create your DAP strategy, the better. Um, and um, and a DAP strategy is going to think about what do you want to achieve, you know, organizational wise. As far as a digital adoption, it helps you um, align your strategy to the overall company strategy, and then it helps you do that. Set up your your um, objectives, your product analytics, your COE, and then your value realization. So yeah, uh, the sooner the better. And as a follow up question, where does the COE sit within the organizational structure? Who pays for the the COE? So there's a couple of different thoughts around that. Some people like to have it in the business side of things. The hard part is how do you, you know, for me, I think it should be a global team within the organization that looks across all functional areas. So we have clients who have that within a functional area and now are trying to figure out how to get it across. Um, they don't necessarily see it as an IT thing because they feel that IT is just there to implement the product, right? An IT product and not responsible for the adoption and usage. If you're an IT product managed organization, I think it makes sense to have it in IT because you are managing the full life cycle of that product. And that should include adoption and usage and ROI. So it would make sense, right? Um, but if you're not set up that way, then it makes sense to have it in either a digital transformation user experience um, organization, or now the new and emerging digital workplace teams. Thank you, Grayson. I'm not sure who would be best to answer this one. One more question. AI oh, is, in GIP sounds yeah. exciting. How soon before we start seeing that manifest? Okay. It's I'll, kind of, I'll yeah. kind of answer ahead, that, on. yeah. So so it's, it's, it's already been used um, in the product. Um, in terms of some of the features that I discussed, um, they're currently being tested by some of our, um, what we call our business partners. So those are customers that uh, we work very closely with um, on new features. So they are being tested at the moment. I've been in a couple of meetings recently with our CTO who, who has stated that um, you'll see these features being rolled out in kind of the Q4 of this year, maybe Q1 next year, releases of the product. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. Thanks, Gracie. And I just, can I say one more thing? So sure. one of the things we also, um, I created at Wafix was a mat adapt maturity model, uh, a material matrix. So one of the second question of that question was, how do you know if you're mature enough to start thinking of COE? You don't have to worry about that. If you come and talk to me, I can show you, but we actually have a maturity matrix and that says, you know, these are the four phases of the maturity for your DAP program. And once you complete this particular phase, that's a great time to start your COE. So all of that has sort of been defined and I can answer that question a little bit more in detail if anyone's interested afterwards. Brilliant, thanks, Gracie. Cool, thank you, Nikita. Thanks, Gracie. Um, this particular customer had made a significant investment in the CRM application, Salesforce. Uh, they wanted to empower their salespeople to manage their business and client, client relationships um, as effectively as possible. Uh, but despite the customer's learning team providing a really strong training setup, users still struggled to leverage Salesforce in their sales process. Um, an initial training emphasis was heavily focused on how to use the tool, but, but there was heavy customization to Salesforce and this resulted 
in a diverse and high number of processes being implemented within the app. So the customer's training team decided that interactive on-demand training that helped users in the flow of work was probably the best way forward. Now, according to the customer, the Watfix powered on-screen guidance technology has really been game-changing in how training is delivered for both onboarding and reinforcement of training. And now how-to training is on demand as users get assistance whilst they're doing uh, or, or, or working on those processes. Um, and the training has become very focused on why using a CRM is important and its benefits to both the user as an individual and the company. And the Watfix has had a huge impact on the approach to Salesforce and connected systems training. And there's, there's been some pretty dramatic cost saving benefits. There's been a 50% reduction in training time, which means that users can just get on with their jobs quicker. There's been a 60% reduction in content creation time. And that not only saves money, but it allows the learning team to focus on the needs of the business. There's been a 20% increase in the quality of the data in Salesforce, and that allows the business to make better decisions. And in the first year of Watfix being used, there was a 70% increase in user productivity. Uh, and this is just one of many um, uh, customer use cases that we've got. And one question that I normally get asked is, is there a specific industry that benefits more from a digital adoption platform than any other? And if, if I was to share our customer list with you, you would see that our customers are spread pretty evenly across multiple industries because every industry has an adoption problem. Thank you. I think the next slide is a Q&A slide, Akita. Yes, that's right. So this is, yep, exactly as Paul mentioned, uh, our final slide, we, we'll cover off some any additional questions that have come through. Um, Gracie, I guess one question that's come through additionally is, if you have multiple DAPs, for example, within an organisation, what's the best way to start a centre of excellence or to consolidate? Um, if you're using a, you know, one DAP for one project and another for another, how do you start going about uh, preparing? Yep. So. Adapt at the end of the day is a piece of technology, right? It's a tool. So the most important thing you can do to align your tool is to have a strategy. So I would start with having a digital adoption platform strategy. How are we going to use this application? What are the objectives of you know having of using it? So are we using it for improving employee experiences or are we improving for digital adoption? So um, that's what's important. So one of the, when I present on our program, I basically try to open up people's minds as to how or what the program is about, right? So you can look at using a digital adoption platform to introduce a consistent user experience across all your different applications and addressing all those very important moments of need, as Paul mentioned. You can use it as a change management tool to make sure that you are providing people the ability to do the change and also they reinforce that change. Or you can do it as I showed, which is we're gonna be very business objective focused. And so we need to build complete DAP solutions around those objectives. And there's like three or four different models that we use. That's the first part, right? Understand which models and models really help sort of frame what your program is going to do. The second thing you need to do is really establish one team, having all these different uh, you know, tool people and, and within one team who are going to now work on that implementation. And then at the end of the day, you just use the right tool for the right instance, right? So it could be the one is more apt to be used in let's say SAP or desktop um, than others. So I know that some dApps work really well on a desktop application and some don't. So you know, um, one, some of them may have other, some things in analytics that others that don't. At the end of the day, you can change the way that the dApps look so that they're very similar. So that it's also seamless to the user. Is it better to have everything in one 
I think so. Um, basically because it takes a lot of effort, especially from the technical side to keep up with the upgrades and the changes and the new releases. So having two of that, I think would be very challenging, but it can be done. Brilliant, thank you. And I think we may have covered this question, but it's just coming again. How much of building a center of excellence needs considerable upfront investment and how much of it can you do with the, you know, the facilities that you have at your disposal already? Yeah, that's a great question. So every company already has people working on digital adoption. You just have them in different pieces and different parts of the organization. You may have them in learning and training. You may have them in performance support. You may have them in process optimization. Um, when I built my team, I got people from all over because you're not, you don't want a team of all learning and training folks, right? You don't want a team of all this or that. You really need to have a mixture of capabilities and backgrounds. That what's really, you know, diversity is, is a thing for real, right? So you don't have a very diverse group. So what I would do is I would look at my existing resources and I would pull people who already are gravitating towards, you know, I have a passion for educating people, improving, you know, solutions, improving workflows. We have tons of people like that in our organization. And so I would bring those people together. You can upskill them on using a digital adoption platform. That is not a great big feat, right? They're usually very easy to use, very easy to learn type of applications. Put them in contact with, you know, someone who's, you know, knowledgeable about DAP strategies and such, and then um, give them, you know, uh, a little time to come together and, and put your program together. But the investment is in the technology, which you can start, you know, kind of light um, and then grow into it over the year or two. And definitely from a resource perspective, it really shouldn't take any more investment than just pulling the right people together into, into that dedicated team. Brilliant, thank you, Gracie. I think those are all the questions that we have at the moment. Um, if you have any more questions, feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A or reach out to us directly. But with that, I'll hand you back over to our host, Kim. Hello. Uh, thank you to all of our presenters today for such a great discussion. And I also want to send a big thank you to everyone who joined us today for your time and attention. I personally will be sending you an email um, as a follow up with a recording from today's presentation, as well as a copy of today's deck. Um, we hope you'll join us again for another of our upcoming webinars. Please visit GP Strategies website to see our future sessions. And I wish everyone on the call a wonderful and productive rest of your day. This webinar was brought to you by GP Strategies. Together, we help organizations transform through their people. You can access more webinars or download additional resources by visiting the GP Strategies resource library. The link is on your screen and in the description.